is an assistant professor of our department with a research interest in interest in AI, machine learning, data science, game development, and also graphics. And the title of this talk today is Explainable AI Explain. And the goal is to I hope the goal is to make uh, AI and machine learning systems more transparent. Okay. So let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Uh... Hi, everybody. Well, yeah, thank you for the fantastic introduction. Um, so yeah, the title of this talk is, I don't know, I think cleverly, uh, Explainable AI Explained. Now, before we move into things, uh, I just want to set some expectations. Because um, I want everyone coming into this uh, on the same page, and I don't want anyone leaving disappointed. So, um, explainable AI is a massive field, despite being relatively new. In fact, the majority of the work that you'll find out there comes from the years 2018 to 2020. Um, and so given that, what I want to do here today is give you the gentlest of introductions to this field. Um, give you a high level overview of the techniques used and really, in my view more importantly, why this is necessary, why this is such an interesting area to look into. And so hopefully by the end of this talk, you will kind of know the buzzwords, know the keywords, so that if you find anything especially interesting, you can go out into the world and wade through all of this research yourself and kind of have an idea of what you're looking at. So with that, So first, we're just going to jump right into it. We're going to try to solve a thing. What is explainable AI? Uh, usually in classes, I'll start with this kind of question because I don't know, I find it pretentious. Um, and usually I have an answer ready to go. Here, not so much. It turns out, even though there's been a wealth of research done in explainable AI, no one can really agree on a definition. Um, and so one of the first challenges that we have, and this is what kind of the first part of the talk is going to be, is trying to figure out how we want to define it, how we want to describe it. Um, I am going to start with kind of a working definition, although it's kind of funny, I don't even especially like this definition, it's just one that I found, and I can blame IBM for. So this you can find online, you can find this on IBM's website. This is their definition of explainable AI. So an explainable artificial intelligence is a set of processes and methods that allows human users to comprehend and trust results and output created by machine learning algorithms. If anyone's had me in a class or knows me, you might have an idea of why I really don't like this definition. It's because notions like trust. What does that mean? No one really knows what that means, or uh, it's hard to define that. So in this definition, we have other things that we need to define, but from this, we can pick out something interesting. Um, and it's, we need to, uh, the explainable AI needs to somehow convey its decision-making process. Um, it somehow needs to get the user to understand what it's trying to do, or how it's coming to something. But why, though? So this is our working definition we'll start with, but I think it's important to understand what exactly explainable AI gets you. Why do we even care about understanding what's going on behind the scenes in a machine learning method? And I pose this question because for a long time, no one, well, practitioners didn't really care. This was their actual view of a machine learning system. You take in some input, it goes into a black box, and you get stuff that comes out. And for many engineers, this was plenty fine. And I've seen, I've worked for some people that thought like this. I have a problem, I throw a neural net at it. But a neural net's not appropriate, sir. I don't care. I'm going to use this. And any time I get to post this comment or put this comment in a presentation, I will, again, this kind of reflects the sentiment of what machine learning was about for a long time. I take a bunch of data, 
I throw it into my linear algebra machine, and I get something that comes out. But what if it's wrong? I don't know. I'm just going to mess with the data until it looks right. I don't care to understand why it's wrong. I'm just going to mess with it until it's not wrong anymore. And this is what things were like for a long time. I'd say, God, even through grad school for me, so this is through like 2012, this is the state of things. So what changed? What made it so that we don't learn and that we want to think about um, these bigger problems? And my argument is it's you all. It's people, humans. Um, as AI systems became more sophisticated, there was this um, draw towards uh, giving the systems back to the people, towards integrating them into society. And so suddenly, people that may have only heard in passing about AI, but definitely didn't know how these things worked, were coming into contact with intelligent systems every day. Like, I use this example a lot, but your phone, it has a very complex AI assistant in it, Siri or Cortana, or um, I don't know what Google's is called. Is it okay, Google? That's what I say, it does stuff. But either way, people are now uh, seeing AI in action. And these people have no idea how it works. And when it works fine, great. But if suddenly it does something that you don't expect, well, that's where you run into trouble. That's where people start to wonder, should I actually be listening to this thing? And if suddenly that little seed of mistrust grows, they might refuse to adopt it altogether. And so one of the biggest reasons that there was this increased interest in explainable AI was trust between a human and a machine. The idea was that maybe if a machine was, to use the term, more transparent, or if I could understand what how it was making its decisions, maybe I would be more likely to trust its output. And even if it was wrong, if I understood the reason that it was wrong, maybe I'd be more likely to accept that fault instead of rejecting it outright. And this type of intuition has been confirmed over and over and over again in numerous qualitative studies. So this is just one, this is from one rather large study across, I think, five different countries where they polled people about their willingness to accept AI or trust AI. And this is that data broken down by age group. And what's notable here, so you see kind of a common trend, you see a trend you would expect. Here's that as age goes up, willingness to accept AI goes down. For me, what's interesting is that even amongst the youngest population, 18 to 39 years old, people are still relatively hesitant about AI. 27% of people are willing to approve of AI or embrace AI, which is the higher level on the questionnaire they gave people. And 34% are likely to trust the output of an AI system over an alternative. So those are really small numbers. And it turns out that's going to hinder the, the adoption of AI. So uh, robots for healthcare, self-driving cars, all of these advancements that really the AI community is kind of going all in on, there's a chance that they'll never get off the ground because people just won't accept them. Now in that same study, they query people as to, well, what would cause you to change your mind? What would cause you to, to improve your trust or increase your likelihood of trusting an AI system? And so these were the top four features that popped out of here. So a lot of them have to do with like regulation and safeguards, but number three there, familiarity with the AI. This is understanding how the AI makes decisions. And this is where or this is where explainable AI fits in. So the idea that if I know more about what's going on behind the scenes, I'm more likely to trust the system. And then that trust in the system is more likely to lead to me accepting AI in general. So this is one of the big reasons why there's such an interest in explainable AI currently. But there are also other, so that's like kind of the big uh, a social good reason for explainable AI. There are also uh, various practical benefits to having an AI that can reason and communicate its own decision-making mechanisms. One of these is verification. So, imagine I've got my little image classification scheme. It takes in an image 
and spits out, in this case, the phrase, this is a Labrador. And maybe it's right. Maybe it's, a, you know, hey, that's a Labrador. Pr Proudy. Proudy you in this classifier. What we would hope is that the reason it came up with this has to do with that dog and not that cat. And so a system that can explain itself, we can go back and verify these assumptions, verify that this is the case. So over here, this is actually the output of a very famous, uh, very famous explainability method that we may or may not be talking about later, called line. And these pixels that are highlighted here, the image that you see, this is the area of the image that explains why Labrador was chosen. And lucky for us, hey, it's the dog. <laughs> so in this sense, we might be willing, more willing to accept, ah, yes, this is doing what we wanted to do. This image classifier understands what's going on in the image um, and is making decisions accordingly. View. All is not always that nice. So this is an example of okay, so uh, there is a picture that I see. Yep. And uh, the statement, this is a Labrador. Yep. I don't understand the context. Uh, ah. what, what should I grasp? What, what should I explain? What's the question? So in this case, what the uh, what the problem is is you're given an image and you're told to classify it. So what's the content of the image? And in this case, it was trained in a supervised fashion. So there was a tag associated with this, which was a Labrador. This is the output. Right, so why this is a Labrador? To me, it's not a faithful representation of what's in this system. Mm -hmm. So, this is a relationship between mm -hmm. a cat and a dog. To me, that is what this picture is about. So, yes, that is what the picture is about. But this goes back to the original tagging. So, the tags come, come on. So, it was given Labrador is the target that you're trying to achieve. And it achieves it. And given that it achieved it, it's going to go and try to identify well, what elements in that picture well, made right. me think that that was the case. So uh, uh, let's say humans are shown these pictures and they are asked to identify the breed of the dog in the picture. Mm -hmm. OK. And the human would look at it and would say, this is a lot of dog. Yep. And the uh, machine would perhaps look at it and do the same. Yes. Especially okay. since it's a right. targeted process. So why don't you ask machine, why did it say that it's a Labrador, but why don't you ask you? Mm. So why don't we ask you? Um, so the main reason why we don't do things like that, ask people, and in some cases we do this. We'll go to people and we'll say, ah, well, why was this the case? And get them to, like, for example, mark up what in the picture made you think that. But there are a couple of issues why we don't always do this. First off is time. Like we don't always have access to people that we can query to, to do this job for us. Uh, the second is expertise. This is a really easy task. We're just identifying what's in there. Imagine we were doing something like protein folding. This is something where now experts are maybe harder to find. Or uh, reading a CT. I look at you, and I say this is Grant Harrison. Yes. Ask me why. I have no idea. And everybody's happy. Nobody's unhappy that I cannot give you the slightest explanation ah, okay. of the mechanism. Uh, so then, nobody cares about it. So nobody the cares about the explainability uh, of the Yes. Yeah. If you were looking at a video, Mm -hmm. that showed somebody shoplifting, and you say this is Brent Harrison, Brent Harrison is going to care why yes, you I, think that I, it's... And so it's the negative cases where it really matters. So if it's right, and you're explaining that it's right, that's kind of like, okay, maybe I don't care so much. Although, again, you, well, yeah, it's, it's the mistakes that we care about. So if this was right, and it highlighted the cat, for instance, that would be bad. I wouldn't want that. That implies that there's some potential problem with my machine learning model. Even though it got the right answer, it got it for the wrong reason. And that's where this comes in. So this is a very famous data set. It's the text data set of news group postings, which I'm pretty sure most people in 
this room did not remember newsrooms. <laughs> People in the back. Um, so what these were, these are the precursors to forums, and it's just essentially people making posts on certain topics. News groups are organized by topics. And these, in this situation, we're looking at um, two classes in particular. One is from a Christian news group, the other is from an atheist news group. These were not chosen for any reason other than they are meant to be kind of polar opposites of each other, distant. And so you'd expect them to post about different things. So, what you're seeing is, this is the results, well not the results, but um, there are text classifiers out there that can get incredibly high accuracy on this data set. 92% across 20 classes. Incredibly high. Here, we're looking at an individual example that was taken from the atheist data set. And it's specifically asking, where can I find a Darwin fish? Mm, innocuous. And the classifier gets it right. Says this is from the atheist data set. You can see here, 58% chance or 0.58 score associated with this being from the atheism news group. However, we've highlighted here are the words that most contributed to that prediction. And oh, what words they are. I hope you can read it. Posting. Um, host. NNT. These, I don't know about you, but these do not indicate to me you know, anything super unique about the atheism news group. Yeah. Um, well, it might be the case that in the original data set, the uh, different news groups use very different underlying tech for presentation of. It's very good, very good. In fact, that's exactly what happened here. But this is a situation where the explanation reveals a flaw that we wouldn't have found otherwise. And I was, you preempted my question. I was going to ask why might this have happened. Uh, one, it could be a problem with the machine learning model itself. But in this case, it's actually a problem with the data. So it turns out, uh, if you look at uh, posting, posting is part of the header of this. Um, and it exists in 20% of the examples in this data set. However, only two of them are in the Christian subgroup, in the Christian part of the data set. And when they went to test this, and again, they got that super high accuracy, there were, that ratio was repeated. 20% of the test set had posts in it, none of them were in the Christian, or two of them were in the Christian side of the, of the data set. And so here, what we've done, and this is another thing that uh, explainability allows us to do, is identify biases in our data. Machine learning is notorious for picking up on biases. This is one of the dangers of using it, really, is that all of, all of the societal biases that you might not like to look at, but are, that are encoded in the data that we gather, they get reflected right here. And if a system can explain why it's doing what it's doing, it helps us better identify these biases. And so this is, yeah. This is all why, my why. These are the benefits of having explainable systems, the things you can do. Now the bigger question is how exactly do we go about doing this? Uh, before I move on, any questions? Yeah? You seem to be conflating AI with machine learning. Yep, and that's something that happens in the literature too. Um, it, uh, it's called XAI, explainable AI. However, it's almost uniquely a machine learning thing. Um, now that being said, I have not given thought to the possibility of using it on more classical AI. So for instance, like an A-star search type thing, is there a reason, or can you do, or create explainable methods there? Don't know, it's just something that's not of interest right now. A number of years back, Eric and Victor and I did uh, an explainable logic puzzle solver, mm -hmm. and it was not using machine learning. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, I, one of the things that I've been interested in recently is doing this for reinforcement learning. So for any sequential problem, really, because the problem with, uh, well, with sequential things is that the explanation might not be in the immediate action you took, but it's something that it enables down the road, and that's something that's difficult to reason about, which is why I believe people haven't looked at it yet, because they're focusing on the easier problems of that. So, yeah, there is this conflation between AI and machine learning in this field. So actually, there is research on expert systems 
and explainability, logic, programming and explainability, it is out there. It is minority, but it is definitely there. That's good. Glad to see that we've got that. We've got Wait, say it again. Oh, are humans more explainable than the AI? I don't know. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Humans are even more unpredictable than AI. So, <laughs> now, oh boy, now we're getting into me possibly sitting, standing on a soapbox for this one. Um, so the question is, um, you know, I'm inferring a little bit here, is that, well, humans aren't necessarily super explainable. And so, like, Either why aren't we focusing on human explainability, or why do we bother with AI explainability? Um, I have opinions on this, and so why not share them now? Um, so my view on this is that we as humans kind of hold AI and really all machines to a superhuman standard. Um, it's not like there are some people, myself included, that believe that AI, in order to be like readily accepted, needs to be able to perform better than a person in a similar situation, and explainability, in my view, and again, purely my view here, uh, is another example of that. But that being said, um, the other thing about human unpredictability is, if you do something that I don't expect, I can do two things. First off, I could just come up and ask you, hey man, why'd you do that? A lot of AI systems, before people started being interested in this area, couldn't reason about that question. Uh, like, what do you mean, why did I do this? It's did it. Or, here's my score for the action that I took. It's high, so I did it. The other thing is, and now we get into a little bit of a philosophical argument, I can acknowledge you as another human, and even though you are not me, I can at least assume that you're using a similar thought process to me. And so this kind of theory of mind thing allows me to find some common ground with you. With an AI system, a lot, for a lot of people, there is no common ground. And so it's like, I'm trying, or a lot of the goals of explainable AI is to kind of bridge that gap as much as we can. But excellent question, I love that question. Anything else? Very good. So how do we do this? And how we do this is by starting with more definitions. So before we really get into like how are we going to make an AI explainable, it's important to understand this little dichotomy here of interpretability or interpretableness versus explainability. So, an interpretable system. And again, there are no concrete, there's no one accepted definition of this, but I'm going to use the one that I do like here. So a system is interpretable when inherently you can look at it and understand why it's doing what it's doing. It is a property of the machine learning model itself. So a technique is either interpretable or it isn't. Um, you can't make something interpretable. Whereas, and, and sometimes, this is referred to as anti-hoc explainability. Because before you train anything, by nature of using this type of model, you are gaining some amount of explainability. Interpretable. Versus explainability, sometimes called post hoc explainability, where the idea is after the system is trained, after you make a prediction, you're going to have to do something to explain that prediction. Be it pass it to another model, be it try to, I don't know, run the example backwards through the neural network, something has to be done. The model itself is not inherently explainable. So, interpretability, explainability. And so, how we're going to start here is with the easy stuff, interpretable methods. These actually end up being critically important to explainability in general, is understanding um, interpretable, me uh, interpretable methods and what makes them interpretable. So, any ideas? I, I like to poll the audience. <laughs> if you had to choose, pick your favorite machine learning method, something that you could show anybody and you think that they would have a reasonably easy time guessing why a certain prediction was made, what would you pick? Anyone's taking 416. Huh? Uh, for 
perceptron. Perceptron, ooh. So that one is close. The only thing, the reason I'd argue that that's not interpretable is because of the nonlinear activation function. That kind of mess, but that's a good guess. Perceptron, the simplest neural network, one layer. Decision tree. There it is. <laughs> the decision tree. Classic ML method, the first assignment on a given 460, and the one that students just hate the most. I don't know why. So this is the classic example, and I wish the yellow showed up a bit uh, more faded or whatever, but whatever. Um, this is the classic example of an interpretable machine learning model. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with decision trees, how this model works is, well, it's a tree structure. The nodes, um, the interior nodes in the tree, represent you can think of them as questions. Specifically questions you're asking about uh, the attributes in your, in your machine learning problem. So in this case, this is a problem of whether I should walk to lunch or ride the bus, take the bus to lunch. And my attributes, the things I'm looking at to make that decision are, what's the weather like? How much time do I have for lunch? And am I hungry? Or am I just dead? And so in a decision tree, the edges, the, the branches between nodes represent the possible outcomes for a given, uh, a given attribute. So the weather attribute has three branches because there are three possible values it can take on. Sunny, cloudy, rain, sun, cloud, rain. Now when you're using this to classify, or you're using this to do your machine learning task, what you do is you simply take your example, you look at it, the values of each feature for that example, and you traverse the tree until you get down to a leaf in yellow. In which case, at what point you make a prediction. So if I had an example where it was currently cloudy, and maybe I'm not hungry, what I would do is I would start at the top. Say, what's the weather like? It's cloudy. Go down the middle branch. Am I hungry? No. All right. Take the right branch and make a prediction at bus. Just by looking at this, I can tell you why I made that decision. Because I just walked back up the tree. I, I decided to take the bus to lunch because the weather was cloudy and I was hungry. This is an interpretable model because everything you need to know is right there. Very clearly stated as a set of rules. Now, will everybody be able to interpret this? Probably not. But most people can. It is pretty straightforward. <laughs> Any other ideas? There's actually one other that's important. This is one. Simple models, people. Simple models. Good old linear regressive. Uh, not the first assignment in machine learning. It's the second one, actually. So, John. So linear regressor, simple task of taking some uh, dependent, or sorry, independent variable or independent variables, x, and coming up with a function that maps it onto some dependent variable y. The reason that this is interpretable, the reason that this is kind of easy to understand, is because the model itself can be described using this very simple linear function. And so any ideas as to how you determine what features are primarily responsible for a given output, given this information. When you're doing a regression, you're trying to learn these coefficient values, these beta values here. So the beta values that are either in, like highly positive or highly negative are likely to be the ones that are going to have the most effect on your output. Because again, this is just additive linear model. And so if I have a, my learning coefficient that has a very high positive value, well, that means that it's likely that if I have a positive value output for my y, that feature has something to do with it. This is a little more difficult to interpret than the decision tree, because everything is not just laid out there. But it's still reasonable to say bigger numbers or more highly positive or highly negative numbers are associated with more important features. And this ends up playing a role uh, later on. Everyone with me so far? This is 
reinterpreting this stuff. Now, something that I was at least not aware of this trade-off being like a specifically defined until very recently. But I'm sure you noticed that both of these methods are incredibly simple. And so there is a question of why don't we just use interpretable methods for everything? Why don't we bother with neural networks at all if we care about explainability? Why don't we just use neural network interpreters, decision trees for everything, or linear regression for everything? And the issue is that that is going to severely limit you on accuracy. So there is a trade-off between interpretability and accuracy, typically because interpretable models are simpler um, than non-interpretable ones. And so that's going to limit the kinds of problems that you can solve. And so in literature, they kind of formalize this trade-off. And in fact, over here, oh, is this okay? It's, it's, oh, it's okay. So you can map these axes and kind of look at where certain approaches fall. So down here at high interpretability but low accuracy, you have logistic regression, kind of the binary version of regression. Here's our good friend decision trees. They're more accurate, maybe a little less explainable. I don't necessarily agree with that placement, but whatever. And all the way up here in the corner, uh, you see, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. all the way up here in the corner, you've got neural networks, high accuracy, no one knows what's going on inside there. Big ball in your own. And so this kind of necessitates the use um, or some way of turning these more sophisticated models into an explainable system. So we need some way to convert the, the more complex models or more enabled explanation on more complex models. So that leads to the second part of the talk. Before moving on again, any questions? Very good. So before we move in here, we have, I'm sure what everybody wanted, more definitions. So even inside of this half of explainability methods, there are more distinctions between the types of things you can do. And I'm just going to give you kind of the high level, like a, a simple taxonomy for separating things out, one that I think is useful when you're just starting out. And so there are two axes here. Um, the first of which, is that explanations and methods for explanation can either be model agnostic or model specific. So what this means, if it's model agnostic, is that this method, whatever it happens to be, doesn't care what your base machine learning model was. This will work on convolutional neural networks, this will work on recurrent neural networks, it'll work on anything you can think of. And you contrast that with model specific methods, these are somehow tied um, to the base machine learning model that you're trying to explain. So you can't use a model-specific method that works on a CNN, convolutional neural network, on an RNA. You have to do something different. So that's one way to distinguish methods for explainability. And the other is more the level of the explanation. It can either be a local explanation, in which case I have a single example that I'm trying to explain why did I make this one decision versus global explanation where I'm trying to explain the capabilities of my entire model. So kind of its performance on everything, not just a single example. Now in this talk, I'm going to focus on the easy stuff, like half of this. I'm going to focus on local explanation. So if I give you one example, you predict something with that example, why did you do that? But I will be going over um, two model agnostic approaches and also two model specific approaches, although the model specific approaches are really, really good. And now I'm going to give you the papers too, so if you want to go find them, here you are. So the first approach, and this is by far the most, at least, what it? is it still? Yeah, probably. This is probably the most recognizable explanation method out there. So it was first introduced in the paper, why should I trust you, explaining the predacifier. And based on the name, you can tell this is a model agnostic approach. Anyone know the name of this? The name of the method? Just kind of gauging. Okay. It's called LIME. Spoiler, it's what I was using at the very beginning. And so LIME stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. 
And so how Lime works is, so it works kind of similarly to how other model agnostic approaches work. So the idea is that, well, the base model is not interpretable. I have no idea what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use its input and its output to, simply enough, train an interpretable system, train an interpretable machine learning model to predict why certain inputs result in certain outputs. This is why the linear, like understanding the linear, the, the linear regressor and the decision tree were interpretable is important because they're both used by line in different situations to explain outputs. <laughs> Some people view this as a cop out. It's like, oh, how do you how do you um, explain complex models? Train an interpretable one, but it's worked surprisingly well in practice. And so, specifically, what Lime looks to do is it's going to train what is called perturbed input. And so, the reason for this is because we want to understand why certain elements of our input, what or which certain elements of our input contribute to our output. And the easiest way, or at least the most sensible way in this case to do that, is to take those input units and mess with them. And as we mess with them, we expect the behavior of our underlying machine learning model to change. And we're going to look at those changes and build them from there. And so what do I mean here? Here's the example that's used in the paper. So I've got this fun little picture of a frog, a little tree frog. Now, in images, classically, your features are individual pixel values. Um, that's obviously too small to use here. So the first thing that they do is they break up the image into segments that they call super pixels. And this gets us our set of features. These are the things that we can perturb. And from this set of super pixels, we are going to construct a brand new training set to train our interpretable machine learning model be it a linear regressor or a decision tree, whatever. In the paper, they use a, uh, a regression model. So based on our uh, super pixels, we are going to perturb them, which means we're just going to turn some of them off or on. We're going to gray out ones that we are turning off and leave the rest there. And so here's an example of us doing that to get three different examples. So in the top one, we've got you know, still a face of a frog. In the bottom one, or in the middle one, we got pretty much nothing. And the bottom one is practically the whole frog. Using these models, we're going to pass them back through the original trained model. And so you can see with the whole frog, the probability of this being a tree frog was just 54% to start off with. However, if we pass in the top one there, suddenly it shoots up to 85%. We pass in the middle one, we tags, and we pass the bottom one, we're at 52%. Each of these becomes a training pair for our locally weighted regression. And so we create a bunch of these perturbed examples, we then train them on the locally weighted regression, and then based on the coefficient values for each of these, uh, uh, each of these individual like superpixels, we can, with a little threshold, come up with this image here. These are the super pixels that had the highest coefficients, thus our explanation for why did this get 54% accuracy as a tree frog? This middle bit is what did the most. And if you look back at our perturbed training set, notice the part that has like, the face of the frog is uh, when it skyrocketed up to 85%. Now, something else to note, this is a locally weighted regression, which means that our training examples each have a different weight attached to it. So we care about the performance of some more than others. Any idea why we might want to weight these? So, look at our middle example here. Should we weight this performance as much as, for example, this one down here? I don't know about you, but I think not. And the reason is because this example down here is really close to the original image. Whereas this one is practically empty. And so the idea is that we want to weight these training examples higher if they're closer to our original image. So 
this is our little late weighted progression. And that, in essence, is the line. Now, there's a lot more complicated like math going on behind the scenes, but this is the overall idea. Perturbed by input, um, train an interpretable model, and then combine everything to get the region of, the, of most input. So Judy, this one's for you. Um, I think you'll get a kick out of it. The second most common. Um, oh, get it. On the previous one, I had a question. Yeah. So, like, um, there was something called uh, uh, attention maps when they were explaining ImageNet. We'll get there. Kind of does something like this. So why aren't we using that instead? So attention maps, so we're going to talk about them. Um, attention maps are not model agnostic. Attention maps are tied, at least depending on how you're, you're talking about them. But attention maps are usually tied specifically to the method um, that they're implemented in. So for example, you can't use an attention map if attention isn't part of your machine learning model. And so that's why, like the reason you would use this is because I can use any base machine learning model as, uh, well, as the thing I want to explain. Whereas an attention map, you have to have an like a neural attention mechanism in place in order to unwind it. So we do talk about them later when we're talking about model-specific uh, approaches. But it does end up getting you something pretty similar. It's just this you could use on any base model. So the next approach, this is by far, this came out at about the same time as line. They're often talked about together. It does a similar task, and it goes about in a similar way to line. This is still looking to identify features in our original data set that are most, um, that most affect my output. But it goes about it in a slightly different way. So this paper introduced SHAP, which stands for Shapley Additive Explanations. And so the idea here is that we're going to look at the machine learning problem not necessarily, or explaining a machine learning problem not necessarily uh, like we would in line. We're going to look at this like our data set is, or perturbing the data set is like a coalition formation game. And so here, what we'll do is we'll treat each individual feature as a player in the coalition and then attempt to compute Shapley values that will tell you, and this is, again, a horrible, probably horrible definition on my part, Judy can give you a much better definition, um, but we'll use Shapley values to determine how much a feature contributes to an output. And so a Shapley value, roughly stated, tells you how you should distribute payout amongst players, like members of a coalition. And so the idea here is that these players join a coalition, they collectively work to get some output, but they're not all working the same amount. Some are working harder than others. And so using a Shapley value, you can fairly distribute this payout amongst the members of the coalition. Well, now imagine, instead of coalitions and players, we have features that are either turned on or off. And so how Shap works, Again, it's still trying to perturb the input in such a way that it can figure out like how uh, how attributes um, uh, how they contributed to changes in the output. And so this is an example of what that looks like. So imagine this is determining the cost in euros of an apartment, and I've got four features here. One is uh, is the apartment park side. That's what the little tree is. Second. How many square square meters is the apartment floor plan? Um, what floor of the apartment building is it on? And are cats banned or allowed? And so in the initial one, cats are banned. And um, it's a 50 uh, square meter floor plan on the first floor and it's park side. And so the cost of this is 310,000 euros. Cool. If we wanted to see how maybe the cat, uh, the, the, how much perhaps uh, the cat being banned contributed to this prediction, what we would do is we would start taking samples. We would take samples where cats are banned, cats are not banned, but also where every iteration of this, or every like, 
combination of features is turned off and on. And every time you turn off a feature, you can think of it as, I'm removing it from this coalition. Every time you turn it on, you're considering it back in the coalition. And based on this, you compute Shapley values for each, uh, for each attribute. And once you've done this for like every combination, not usually done in practice, because that's an exponentially large set, but you determine the Shapley value of a single attribute as just the average of the marginal contributions across all coalitions. So SHAP in practice is typically done via sampling. However, there have been papers that have been written on how tractable it is because it can be difficult to compute these values. But the sampling approach is very, very popular. However, they're not perfect. Uh, there's been plenty of work on fooling these methods. Um, and so that's something that, again, I kind of want to drive home. This is all, like, nothing is perfect. There are holes in everything, which is why research is advancing as fast as it is. Okay, so any questions here before we move on to the next thing? Okay. So now we're going to move into the model-specific approaches. And these are your attention maps and your activation maps. And so what we're going to start off with is um, an activation map approach. So here, what we're doing, this is an approach that's meant to be used with uh, deep uh, convolutional neural networks. And as you can see, we'll actually have to go to the next one. Activation maps. So what an activation map is, is it's essentially a heat map on your original input, where the areas with more heat are the areas that have higher values in the internal layers of your neural network. So here, for example, this little doggo here, a lot of heat around the eyes and face, but other places it's relatively cool. How this is generated, at least how these are generated in the paper that I mentioned, is via this GAP, Global Average Pooling Layer. So this is a pretty typical convolutional neural network set. You've got an input going to a series of convolution layers, and typically at the end, what you would do is you would take your, um, this last layer, flatten it out, concatenate it together, and send it along to a bunch of fully connected layers. But here what they do is they run it through a global average pool. And what that does is every individual, and we'll call this the activation map, gets averaged. And then those averages get concatenated. I don't know if the colors came through very well here. Oh no, back up. But this back layer here is blue, and the first circle here is blue. So we condense that entire two-dimensional uh, matrix of values down into a single value by calculating the average, global average pool. These values then get passed to the fully connected layers and are used to make your final prediction. Now, why do we do this? Turns out we can take that prediction, and since we just calculated an average here, we can run it backwards through the network. And this will allow us to project this prediction value back onto the original convolutional, or yeah, back through the original convolution steps. And so here, this is what we end up with if we only look at this kind of last part of the network. Um, so one of these is going to, or each of these slices here, represent the visual representation. They're the visual representation of each of these, like, uh, I don't know what to call them. Dimensions in your volume. So notice here, W1 times this thing. This is that blue layer, except visualized. So most of your heat is around the middle. Similarly, here's WN, which is this bottom one. It's green, I'm colorblind, I can't tell. Most of your volume is around the bottom right. These are all added together in order to get you this final class activation map. So this is a really interesting method because it attempts to figure out what kind of each of these uh, individual activation maps is attending to. And I use attention, but I really shouldn't. So like this first one, or I should say, the ultimate prediction here was an Australian terrier. By adding all these together, we see that, oh, it attends to the dog. So good, that's what we want. 
But not every one of these individual maps corresponds to that. Because the neural network is learning different things. It's learning to pay attention to different things. But by combining things the way we did, it also learns to turn off certain things when it's not looking for it. So this first one is around the person. And so more than likely, this layer of the neural net, or this part of the neural net, has learned to find people. And if it were, um, however, because this training example wanted it to find an Australian Terrier, it says, ah, that part's not important. I'm going to have a low weight here, but the rest will be high. And it'll go on to create that final activation map. And in order to kind of speed things up a little bit, the last thing, a similar approach, is using this idea of attention. It's similar to an activation map, um, but how it's calculated is different. And I'm not going to go into the calculations of attention, but in essence, what it allows you to do is map certain parts of your input directly onto outputs, or more correctly, when you're generating a specific output. So here, if you're generating a specific word in an image caption, your attention will have weights associated with elements of your input. And in this case, the higher the weight, the, the more light it appears. Um, although, funnily enough, these are all examples of attention getting it wrong. So, like, a woman with a table with a large pizza. That's not a pizza. But it's still looking at part of the image when it comes up with that, uh, with that prediction. These can also be used in text. In fact, this is where I first came across them, was in text. So if we're generating a sentence, um, the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. After you generate each word, or before you generate each word, uh, there will be an attention weight on various previous words. These, in this case, the more blue something is, the more it's being used to generate the next word. And so if we come down here to the end, run, when run is generated, you're primarily looking at um, FBI chasing on, and so you're picking up on a lot of things. Topics in the sentence, syntax, all kinds of fun stuff. And so there's been an idea that this is explanation. Why did I generate run here? Well, I was looking at all these words, and so that's why I did it. However, that's not really agreed upon. Um, so I love this paper. Attention is not explanation. Um, there has been work, people again don't agree on whether this constitutes explanation or not. Part of it's because people don't know what explanation is, but in this case it's because they messed with the attention weights and showed that, ah, it doesn't affect prediction accuracy. Thus, attention can't be explanation, and that makes sense. However, then the counter to it, attention is not not explanation, pointed out that, well, you messed with the weights, but you didn't actually retrain it, and so your method was faulty. And so there's a lot of sniping going back and forth between both parties. And in fact, I could have put a third paper in here, which was a survey of the controversy between the attention is explanation people and the attention is not explanation people. So it is not settled. So if you want to, you know, cast your vote, everybody's listening. Okay, and that's it. That's, that's my talk my very broad overview to explainable AI. Um, I didn't get to everything. I only looked at half of the approaches. And so next time, if I do another one, it's going to be called the Bird's Eye View of Global Explainability Methods. Okay, questions? Five minutes. Yeah, we have a few minutes for, uh, for a few questions. Any questions? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned at the start looking into doing explainability with uh, sequential models and so forth. Is there any work in that field that we could speak to yet? Or? There, there is. So the things that I've seen, yeah, the things that I've seen where people have attempted to do this, it falls in the realm of neurosymbolic AI. And this is probably me completely misrepresenting this, so take this off with a grain of salt. But essentially, it's trying to look at the policy, look at, uh, and describe it using symbolic rules. And then the goal is that that's the explanation. 
And so you try to ground this complex policy onto a set of rules, which kind of fits with the train and interpretable model approach here. Um, but it's, from what I've seen, it's been very good. So, that's not to say there aren't other approaches, this is just the one that I happen to come across. Uh, can you go back a few slides to the AI that got things wrong in the pictures? This yeah. One? I love that because I got half of those wrong by like reading the sentence and then looking back at the picture. We're holding a clock in the hand. Yeah, I can see. That. Yeah, it's a clock. Oh wait, no, that's not actually a clock. You ever seen all those explanations do like they do kind of contribute to that trust thing? It's like, yeah, you see where you got that. So there has been work on how um, even the presence of wrong explanations can foster trust. So even if your explanation isn't how the AI actually makes decisions, the fact that you're trying can still make you more trustworthy than something that doesn't. It's actually kind of problematic if you think about it, but it's something people are looking into. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if my question makes a lot of sense because I'm thinking of the, the concept of trust in general. And so um, if there is a machine learning model that gives you some sort of trust, like a check, like this is okay. And so then, you like something that explains how the decision has been made. Is there anything looking at possibly um, altering the data almost like scientifically so that you do get that check mark, but actually um, it's not, it shouldn't be checked? Very good, very good. Um, so, yes, people are looking into that. And the keyword there, is usually adversarially attacking these types of things. And that's something that, um, uh, where was it? That was, uh, yeah, so this is an entire paper on how to fool these explainability methods. And so what that means is that they would try to alter the input ever so slightly, but then see a huge change in how the attributes contribute, or how these methods said the attributes contributed to your output. So yeah, like this is something that people do all the time, is try to poke holes in these methods. Um, and so adversarial attacks is where you want to work. Um, similarly to how you know pixel level attacks on an image classifier. Uh, change one pixel and suddenly everything breaks down. Similar type deal. Any other questions? So some of my work has been on what I call rationalization. And so it said, instead of trying to explain why this does what it does, create an explanation that's very human-like. In my opinion, it's outside of this entirely. Because we're not trying to explain how the system works, we're trying to generate something that actually kind of explains how people think about the problem. So this kind of comes back to what you were saying. You can't, like, why not try to explain people? That's kind of what I've been trying to do. But that's not this. Okay, there we are. All right. Um, if you have time, you can enjoy a few pieces of pizza after the talk. And we first we thank uh, Dr. Uh, Harrison for his exciting. <laughs> Our next seminar will be uh, September 28th.